Um, my name is Lois Nelson. Uh, I'm an architectural historian here in the School of Architecture uh, and a uh, contributing faculty member for the Center for Cultural Landscapes uh, and the um, uh, provost, uh, associate provost for academic outreach here at the University of Virginia. And so it's my really great pleasure for us to think about the ways um, uh, under the leadership of the center uh, that we can take some of the uh, academic content that's so central to the University of Virginia and think about ways that it actually begins to engage with uh, partner with uh, publics uh, for the transformation of all of our futures uh, simultaneously. So uh, this, uh, this symposium is really central to the work that I think the university needs to, uh, needs to be doing increasingly over its, over its coming, um, coming decades. And let me also just begin uh, by asking us all to give a round of applause to Frank and Tanya and to Beth and Carly for spending all of this time aggregating uh, this incredible panel of speakers, thinking about how we can engage this topic really rigorously, but also uh, collaboratively and proactively. Um, I think this whole event just really deserves a round of applause. So if you'll just join me. And I don't know where Tanya is, but wherever you, oh, there you are, Tanya. Excellent. Um, in 2013, the president of the University of Virginia, Teresa Sullivan, established a commission, President's Commission on Slavery. Um, and this began a conversation in official terms that had been going on, started by our students for decades, and particularly our African American students, about what is the role of the enslaved peoples who were so central to the production and operation of this landscape for its first half century. The University of Virginia had a unbelievably underwhelming underfoot slab that's still there that marks a memorial to those individuals who labored to realize Jefferson's vision, the language of which is just so offensive. And uh, so in 2013, a conversation that's been going on for a long time was finally given um, official approval to begin within the president's office and around the university. And one of the products of that has now been this unbelievably exciting unfolding process for uh, a design competition um, which has been uh, won by a team I'll just point out in a, in a second, uh, for the memorialization uh, of that reality in the, in the physical reality of our, of our built environment. So how can we begin to transform the academical village, uh, a sacrosanct landscape uh, erected to the memory, of course, primarily of Thomas Jefferson in our imaginations, how can we begin to change that narrative? Because this is about changing stories. And unless we begin to change that story physically in the materiality of our landscape through design work and through accurate history, we're not going to change those stories. Um, and so it has really my, been my great pleasure uh, over the last year uh, to interact with some of the members of the design team, one of who just ran out to turn off his lights on his Audi, <laughs> Greg Bleem and Frank Dukes and a, and a larger team, but uh, primarily also uh, Mabel Wilson, who is my charge, my charge to introduce. Um, this design team has taken seriously the responsibility of public engagement. Uh, public engagement has been a critical component of this design process from the very beginning. Um, and they have brought together leading designers from around the country uh, to, to help the University of Virginia think about how can we begin to establish a different conversation, a new conversation, frankly, a more truthful conversation about our own history. So it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Mabel Wilson, who's one of the key designers uh, on this team. Uh, Mabel, uh, my text is a little tiny here. Mabel is the Nancy and George E. Rupp Professor of Architecture at Columbia University. Uh, she received her PhD in American Studies. I love the cross-disciplinary nature of that. Her PhD from NYU in American Studies with a dissertation entitled Making History Visible, Expositions and Museums in the Black Metropolis, 1895 to 1995. Uh, she received her MARC uh, from Columbia, and most importantly, she received her Bachelor of Science in Architecture right here from the University of Virginia, of which we're very proud. Her research topics include space, politics, and cultural memory in black America, race and modern architecture, technology and the social production of space, visual culture and contemporary media, and a variety of other topics. She is multidisciplinary in scope. At, uh, at Columbia, she is the senior fellow at the Institute for Research in African American Studies, and she currently directs, uh, co-directs the Global Africa Lab. As a designer, uh, 
Sorry? Oh. As a designer, she was a competition finalist uh, for the African Burial Ground uh, in Manhattan. And she was also a competition finalist for the Smithsonian Museum of African American History and Culture, a really incredibly important um, uh, uh, new project uh, uh, recently opened, as you all know. But she, I also want to highlight uh, an adv advocacy project that she's been working on uh, entitled Who Builds Your Architecture? Uh, so this, uh, this initiative seeks to educate architecture, uh, architects about exploitation and globalization in the construction industry around the world. It's an incredibly important initiative to help uh, even those of us in the academy uh, and practitioners to think about the construction histories and the construction, uh, the, the labor forces uh, that are at play uh, in all of the fancy design work that we do. Uh, she's not just a designer, she's also a scholar. Uh, in 2012, she published Negro Building, Black Americans and World's Fairs and Museums. And her current uh, book project, what I think is, uh, I understand is going to be a, a component of today's talk, is Building Race and Nation, How Slavery Influenced An uh, Antebellum American Civic Architecture. Uh, and lastly, I'd also just like to say I've recently learned that um, uh, Mabel has been promoted to full professor. And uh, all of this work is clearly evidence of that much, much deserved recognition. So please join me in welcoming Mabel Wilson. <laughs> Um, thank you, Lewis, for that lovely um, introduction. Um, again, I, I want to say thank you to Beth, Carly, Frank, and Tanya for bringing together a really fantastic group of, of people um, to sort of talk about really challenging um, issues. Um, I think particularly at this, this moment, um, not only in, in sort of the local history, but clearly national, but I think a lot of these are kind of global questions uh, around inequalities and justices, representations, um, and, you know, questions around restorative justice. Um, and so, um, yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, this is, this is one aspect of a, a much needed public conversation and, and kind of transformation of our, our, our shared um, lived world. So I'm delighted to be here and also to kind of be back where it all started. I, had, I remember, I, I won't tell you how long ago, um, but, you know, coming to UVA and probably sitting somewhere in the fourth row. I think my parents were gone and, you know, it's the first day and being introduced to, to architecture, you know, in this space, actually, in this very room. Um, you know, and spending four years split between, you know, the studios upstairs where you're learning how to make buildings and in here where you're learning the history um, of the discipline, but also kind of being naggingly disappointed that I was never taught by anyone African-American, no one African-American ever sat on my reviews, I sat in histories again and again and again, and I don't think I ever saw anything a black person had conceptualized or made as architect. Um, and so that's kind of led me down the path of, of, of the kind of work that I, that I do do both as an, 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 a scholar um, and, um, and, and a designer is to kind of unpack that and to kind of get us to try to think about what, like why, why that might be the case and how you know, the, our built in, shared built environment might be uh, mobilized differently. So when thinking about race and public space, um, many questions come to mind about space and subjects and, and, and buildings. So you know, how did public space in America become racialized? I think that's one of the questions we're asking. How and why have these spaces of public and civic life you know, how have they changed over time? Um, racial restrictions disappearing, like the black codes of slavery and Jim Crow practices, while new ones like redlining have appeared. One might also ask, how does one even become racialized? We always take that for granted, but that hasn't always been the case as, as, as human beings. To, how do we know when one is black or, or that one is white? Or, you know, like most folks, we're actually mixed. I did my DNA recently and I'm 25% European. So, but, you know, I can, you know, I'm a black person. And, you know, and why are there distinct advantages or disadvantages associated with one or another of these subjectivities? Um, why has it, as, as Dell asked last night, whiteness become a supreme signifier of, of, of whiteness? And, but also, how does the material condition of the built environment racialize through informal practices of building, as well as conceived by the formal practices of architecture? You know, and we all know, is to build a wall is to separate um, here from there, mine from yours, um, and us from them, I think, as we saw last night uh, with the example of the cemetery wall. So I think Beth offered excellent introductory marks, remarks that engaged many of these questions, particularly the persistence of racial division and contention in the public spaces of the city. We've heard already, you know, John talking about 
about Charlottesville and are talking ab about Richmond. Um, and, um, you know, Dell in his talk really gave us a series of case studies um, that unfolded the fault lines around which racialized representations of conflicting histories um, of the Civil War and of the civil rights movements, whose presence, as each monument persistently reminded us in the examples that he showed us, is still determined by what a white civic, uh, white, what the white civic leadership and white publics believe to be the, the proper place of black historical narratives, and ideally unseen, unheard. Um, and it's interesting that everyone always turns to the architects, to the designers, that architecture for solutions. But what if these disciplines were always already enmeshed um, in questions of race? And they perhaps might be part and parcel of the problem. So I want us to think about the relationships between race, public, and architecture by examining earlier American history. And so um, we've talked already sort of about, you know, the Civil War, Reconstruction, Jim Crow, and today, but, but maybe we got to look a little bit earlier and look at the late 18th um, century and really the first decades of the fledg fledgling nation when Thomas Jefferson drew up plans for the Virginia State House in Richmond, but he also penned his observations of his home state, Virginia, in notes on his state of Virginia. So um, as Lewis mentioned, I'm going to give an excerpt from my book, Building Race and Nation. Um, it's very much in progress, um, so bear, bear with me. I'm sort of picking bits and pieces of that chapter, uh, which are still in formation. So um, to start. What is working the, is it the mouse? Okay. Okay. And the keyboard now, I can use the keyboard to. It should work. Yes, yeah. perfect, excellent. Okay, so during the, um, everybody can hear me okay, yes? Okay, so during the uh, revolutionary and post-revolutionary period, key decades of colonial upheaval, um, which also continued the European territorial expansion into the areas of indigenous populations in the Americas, but also the expansion of the slave trade. It was an important period to remember that what we now know as race had not really been defined. It had not been determined in the sense of a scientifically verified variations of a human type organized on a hierarchy of mental and also physical evolution. Uh, and this, of course, would really take place in the middle of the 19th century. Natural philosophers and natural historians had not yet determined the causality of the laws of nature. Instead, they still uh, uh, attributed these forces to nature's God, as did statesman Thomas Jefferson on the origins of human freedom in his introduction to the Declaration of Independence. So as reason became more secular and hence liberal, so did the Enlightenment's ideal subject become self-possessed. That subject became self-determined, that individuals had wills. Um, and eventually they became self-conscious. And that, that was critical um, in, in, in terms of the emergence of a kind of modern, a modern world. So you were no longer the subject of, 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 of religion, of God. You were no longer the subject of a ruler. You were self-determined. So natural rights, that all men were born free, became foundational for new social formations, nation states, whose governments guaranteeing the self-evident right to life and liberty would be guided by historically derived ideas of democracy. And this is clearly unfolding in the latter half of the 18th century, you know, with revolutions in the United States, the Haitian Revolution, and also the French Revolution. However, there were those others of Europe in the New World also in Africa and in Asia. Uh, and the others of Europe I'm borrowing here is a term by scholar Denise De Silva, who weren't modern, they weren't white. And for the Africans um, and, 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 and some indigenous people, they were also not free. And they became to represent distinct notions of time and space in the emerging discourses of history and science. So because the Enlightenment's universal reason relied upon experiment and observation, the conceptualization of what I want to 
call the racial paradigm of human difference depended in part on the visuality of skin culture, the phenotypical. Um, in particular, reactions to darkness and blackness, something evident upon first encounter. In this period, blackness, as scholar Sandra Gilman observed, developed, quote, a specific connotation in white society. It is the exterior sign through which the European rationalizes the inferiority of the black and permits his exploitation in the slave trade. So the aesthetics of blackness was an informant in the rationalization of the variations of human species that divided peoples living in the continents of Europe, Asia, Africa, and the New World, the Americas. So in my talk this morning, I want us to explore how the labor of enslaved black bodies, property, lacking the proper subjectivity to be self-conscious, literally and legally to also be self-possessed, nevertheless built a significant number of the nation's civic buildings in the late 18th century and the first half of the, the 19th century. I feel like Michelle Obama gave me props for my work when she said, you know, slaves built the house that I wake up in every day. So I want us to think about this paradox, how that for many white Americans champion liberty while condoning, simultaneously condoning slavery, they recognize, in fact, violated a fundamental moral imperative, the, the, the ideals that founded the United States. And yet, as I will show through the example of Jefferson, if chattel slavery were to be outlawed and the enslaved emancipated, given their natural character, or what was being determined to be their natural character um, by whites, could they become citizens? Or would common sense dictate their return to their native Africa? necessitating a, their wholesale removal from the space of the new nation. Um, and I've always been fascinated by this painting. I I've, I've first encountered it when I taught an urban uh, history course. Um, and this is Samuel Jennings, who was British, and he did this for the Library Company of Philadelphia, which was kind of one of the first public libraries founded by Benjamin Franklin in a cohort in Philadelphia, where everyone sort of paid into the company. They went and they bought books from Europe and essentially built this public library. That was in fact used, um, you know, when all of our founding fathers came to Pennsylvania, uh, Philadelphia, that's the library they used when they were writing the Constitution. That was one of the libraries that they used as a resource. And what I just find fascinating about this, this image um, is we see, um, this is Cleo, Liberty. Um, her hands are on uh, volumes of philosophy and agriculture. You know, this is the representation of the modern world, the enlightened world, the rational world where you have cartography and geography, music music and the arts, you have heraldry, right? So you have history, antiquity, um, um, you have clearly um, architecture, uh, technology, right? Uh, as if these were from Diderot, um, Diderot's encyclopedia, you, you have astronomy. So, and, and it's a gridded, organized world, and these are the chains. So she is freeing um, the slaves. Um, but notice, right, in that world, who is different? Um, and notice the outline of the rest are in this kind of state of nature. Um, and these are ships um, that would bear them back, back to Africa. This is a bust of, Hen of um, Henry Thornton, who was an early advocate in England of colonization. And, and, and Jennings also, and, and some of the members of the library company actually were sympathetic um, um, toward that. So, so I've always found this a kind of interesting um, kind of representation of that organized world Right of neoclassical, the, of, of neoclassical value of democracy um, and a kind of aesthetic world, you know, kind of versus this sort of natural pastoral buco bucolic space in which uh, slavery unfolded. So a kind of future and a sort of a past or a suspension of history, um, in a way. So. Um, the most beautiful and precious morsel of architecture in 1785. So modeled on the Maison Carré, a Roman temple built in 2-3 CE in Nîmes, France, Virgi um, the Virginia, um, Virginia's new state capitol building sat nobly atop Richmond Chaco Hill. As depicted by architect Benjamin Henry Latrobe's watercolors, the stately stucco-covered brick temple towered above and over the 18th century pastoral landscape of, of Richmond, right? Um, and I would imagine that space um, that Anna talked about is actually just below and out of view of, 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 um, of Latrobe's um, representation. 
Designed by statesman, statesman, architect, and planter Thomas Jefferson, the neoclassical Virginia State House is one of the earliest examples of American civic architecture. Um, Jefferson, indeed, was a very busy man. You could see he was not distracted by the internet and a lot of other things. But, uh, but it is, you know, sort of when you look at Jefferson, I mean, he's, you know, um, working um, to write the Constitution of the State of Virginia shortly thereafter, the Declaration of Independence. He's actually drawing up plans for the Virginia State Capitol. He becomes uh, an ambassador to France. I mean, extraordinarily um, busy and kind of a remarkable polymath in that regard. So in 1784, Jefferson um, succeeded Benjamin Franklin as the minister plenipotentiary, which is um, a kind of ambassador, to France, a post that Jefferson held for five years. During this period um, of his diplomatic assignment to Paris, he had this, this painting was, was done in his only visit to London, um, the former governor of Virginia had been charged with completing the plans for Virginia's new capital building. Um, by the time he arrived in Paris, Jefferson had already spent 10 years, eight of those embroiled in the Revolutionary War, shepherding the transformation of Virginia from an imperial, imperial planter colony to a self-governed state within a democratic republic. With tobacco as its cash crop, fueling the emergence of a wealthy planter class who eagerly sought independence in stewarding their own affairs, Virginia was, in fact, one of the most powerful and prosperous of the 13 colonies. So it was in 1776, shortly after the newly formed United States had officially declared independence from the British Crown, that Jefferson had proposed a bill to the Virginia House of Delegates to move its capital from Williamsburg, the colonial seat since 1699, to Richmond, a fledgling settlement further up the James River. Richmond would be more centrally located, uh, accessible to the state citizens from the Piedmont and also the Tidewater, um, and it's safe from enemy incursion and navigable, which is very critical, by waterway. So you could sort of see that, that landscape. So one key factor for, the, for choosing the location of the new capital was that it be along a river. Access to ports and private plantation docks along Virginia's various um, waterways, the York, the James, the Rappahannock, the, the Potomac, were critical for the sale of hogsheads of tobacco, um, these large barrels that held dried leaves, and their transport to European markets. So this, this cartouche gives you a sense of, of that. Um, and that map was by Peter Jefferson, Thomas Jefferson's father, and I'll talk about why that's significant later. So the mercantile trade built the great wealth of the 18th century planter families, the whales, the birds, the Washingtons, the Custises, and others. The waterways were also critical for the importation of goods, salt, fine cloth, coffee, wine, furniture, books, and black slaves imported from the ports in the West Indies, from Africa, and also in Europe. These raw materials fed the manufacturers that formed the backbone of industrialization in Europe and also in the US. These raw materials fed the growing taste for luxury commodities like tobacco and coffee in the metropoles, but also in the colonies. So if you look closely um, at a portrait of the Washington fam family by Edward um, Savage, for example, we see a depiction of the new world of the planter class transformed into future American citizenry. And it's interesting, talking about enshrining certain narratives of Americanness and whiteness, this is now hanging in the National Gallery of Art, for example. The display of their belongings and holdings and you could see this, this is the map. Um, Martha Jefferson's hands is on the map of Washington City, where the family actually held property. They held plots of land. They pose in front of the vista um, from the plantation of Mount Vernon along the Potomac River. This all represents a racialized as well as a gendered axis of men and nature, the self-determined and the dominated, the owners and the owned. The presence and absence of William Lee, Washington's enslaved valet, and constant companion during the Revolutionary War represents what scholar Simon Gikandi has called, quote, slavery's most powerful haunting of the culture of taste. I think Lee's placement of his hand and his red brass buttoned waistcoat, a gesture of gentility and modesty, complicates his representation as a family prop and as property. <laughs> 
So at the end of June 1776, Virginia ratified its state's constitution, for which Jefferson was an author and a key contributor to the organization of its various governmental functions. In this new system of rule by citizens, Virginia's constitution insisted that, quote, none of these fundamental laws and principles of government shall be repealed or altered, but by the personal consent of the people. So this is rule by the people, not by the king. So Virginia's constitution, its capital and civic buildings, provided a promising model for the future architecture of the new state and also of the new nation. So part of what I'm arguing in this, this particular chapter is that Richmond is kind of a test case for what then happens you know, further, further north in um, Washington, DC. And it symbolized, particularly in Richmond as well, um, and enabled governance by the people. And so Jefferson was not only designing the state house, the governor's house, the courthouse, and also he had a proposal for the jail. So these were all of the elements of the functioning of the government. So the bill to move the capital um, from Richmond to Williams, from Williams, Williamsburg to Richmond laid out a plan for the new seat of government. Jefferson schemed for that district of Richmond divided blocks into plots which were sold at auction, showing the importance of land ownership to Jefferson's vision of Virginia and also of America. And in fact, it was kind of a real estate scheme um, if you sort of think about it in today's terms. Um, Jefferson executed the first designs for the Virginia State Capitol in 1776, which would put their authorship around the same year that Jefferson crafted his proposal to move the state capital and drafted the state constitution. Um, with pen to paper, Jefferson conceived the new government through constitutional declarations, as well as the drawings that organized the state's new political order. Astutely aware of architecture's ability to project the longevity and endurance of the state, Jefferson wrote that the new Capitol and courthouse and all the other buildings should be, quote, built in a handsome manner with walls of brick and porticos. So all of the elements of the new republic, the executive, the legislative, and the judicial branches were accounted for, for Je in Jefferson's bill and his drawings for the state, um, for the state Capitol in, in Richmond. So in 1784, Jefferson would be settled in Paris as an ambassador before he once again took up or attempted to design the new civic buildings for, for the state of Virginia. Patrick Henry, who we've already heard about, who was then the governor of Virginia, had informed Jefferson in 1785 that the construction on the new capital had already commenced based on his earlier drawings in 1776. So it's the worst imaginable scenario as an architect. They're building from your schematic drawings. So Jefferson needed to act quickly so to assist with the preparation of drawings and, 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 and a model that he would send back, Jefferson enlisted the French architect and skilled draftsman Charles-Louis Clarisseau. Um, so, so these are the drawings that were sent to him by his fellow commissioners, Buchanan and Hay. Uh, and you could see they're far less elegant uh, than Jefferson's. They were just trying to get the job done. Um, and so far less elegant than I think what Jefferson had originally proposed. So. Um, so Jefferson had studied the drawings of the perfectly preserved Maison Carré in Clarisseau's book, Antiquities of France, The Monuments of Nîmes. Um, he probably had also first become acquainted um, with the ideal Roman temple, the Maison Carré, through Palladio's four books in his library at Monticello. So Clarisseau, um, who he hired, was an artist and an archaeologist. And, and Clarisseau had prepared painstakingly precise measurements of the Maison Carré. Uh, which he had documented in these engravings featured in his book, The Monuments of Nîmes. Clarisseau's meticulous orthographic documentation of the temple's details, its proportions, and layouts suited Jefferson, who had cultivated not only the eye of an architect, but also possessed the keen observation of a naturalist, right? So to kind of look at antiquity. Um, and so he really admired the skill, I think, of, of Clarisseau. So if Jefferson were to adopt a Roman temple as a model for the new civic architecture of Virginia, what did he hope to accomplish? So in, a September, uh, in September of 1785, um, he sent a letter from Paris to James Madison, his colleague in arms in the arenas of national and state politics. 
Here, Jefferson expressed his desire to ensure Virginia's new state house would become a model architecture worth emulating throughout the nation. Quote, he says, how is taste in this beautiful art to be formed in our countrymen? Unless we avail ourselves of every occasion when public buildings are to be erected, of presenting them with models for their study and imitation, right? So this is clearly something that is supposed to be Im imitated elsewhere in the nation. Jefferson informed his friend that he had selected the Maison Carré as his model. One of the most beautiful, if not most beautiful and precious morsels of architecture left to us by antiquity. So it's almost like he could taste the beauty of the, the Maison Carré and desires to have this in his state. Antiquity offered a perfectly preserved example of classicism, an architecture of democracy, of justice, one that for Jefferson had not been corrupted by the capricious French Baroque, the architecture of the French aristocracy and monarchy. Now Jefferson also informed his friend that the purpose of this novel design for a state house was also educational, heuristic. Quote, its object is to improve the taste of my countrymen, to increase their reputation, to reconcile to them the respect of the world and procure them its praise. So in return for a beautiful work of civic architecture, Americans, white Americans, would gain the regard of Europe which one would assume for Jefferson meant that its architecture would captivate their gaze and their admiration. So the rationale for Jefferson's choice is, quote, very simple, he writes, but it is noble beyond expression and would have done honor to our country as presenting to travelers, one would assume travelers, Europeans, a morsel of taste in our infancy, promising much in our mature age. So what I think Jefferson feared most was the prospect of erecting what he would term a monument to bar barbarism. Jefferson hoped that the new state house would be transformative as an exercise and that it would advance a new culture and society in the new world, a new American civilization. Now his proposed design for the Virginia State House would offer an invaluable public lesson on how architecture could represent the virtues of durability, of utility, and also of beauty. All right. So these are some of the earlier sketches that Jefferson um, had prepared. Uh, again, you know, you could sort of see how he's sort of trying to figure out. Um, you know, the different sort of organization, you know, the fact that there would be this kind of central space that would serve as a kind of gallery um, meant that it was kind of a machine to raise the kind of aesthetic sensibilities of, of what, democracy sh what democracy should look like and the kind of spatial experience of that new, new democratic nation. And, and this was the model that, sent back, that was sent back um, that um, now sits in the Virginia State House. The drawings, unfortunately, were lost. Apparently, they were sent to Washington, D.C. when they were doing the, the, the competition for, for, for um, the U.S. Capitol, and they are now lost. So, so one problem encountered by Virginia and by the new nation of 13 states was to define a national identity. In other words, who were the people that would cultivate American civilization? In this period of the Enlightenment, taste as in a, in a morsel of taste, evident in the cultural accoutrements of art, of dress, of architecture, and also food, right? Um, uh, as the growing appetite for sugar and coffee and tobacco I tell us, all of these, these things around taste became a key indicator of modernity and of the cultural dimension of what is a modern subject. But this culture of taste also held what scholar Simon Gikandi calls, quote, repressive tendencies, namely the attempt to use culture to conceal the intimate connection between modern subjectivity and the political economy of slavery, quote. So that connection between the formation of new citizenry and the enslaved peoples who labor to sustain their lives can be found in Jefferson's Notes on the State of Virginia, written in the same period he developed the designs for the Virginia State House. Notes on a State of Virginia, 1785. A member of the American Philosophical Society and deeply invested in the philosophical tenets and methods of the period, 
Jefferson took great interest in scientific principles drawn from careful observation of the facts, by the careful study of things and of phenomena. This interest in natural history and natural philosophy forms the foundations of Notes on the State of Virginia, Jefferson's only published book. Now, the body of notes originated as a report prepared in response to 23 queries sent to Jefferson and, and others in 1780 by the French diplomat Francois Barbet Mabois, who circulated the survey to gain a better understanding of the geographic and historic character of the newly formed United States. Jefferson, as a surveyor and also as a plantation owner, was well versed in geography, natural resources, populations, and the history of the state. Now, Jefferson had learned the art of surveying and map making from his father, plantation owner Peter Jefferson, who had farmed part of 7,500 acres with a labor of about 50 slaves um, in, in the Piedmont. So what Notes on a State of Virginia actually does is take stock of the natural and human character of Virginia. In the first part, um, Jefferson's taxonomic assessments of plants, animals, min minerals, climates, rivers, mountains, and caves highlights the state's bountiful resources. Also governed by natural laws were the different human races residing in Virginia. You have the, the aboriginals, the indigenous populations, you have the Europeans who came, and also the Africans who were imported as slaves. Notes also reviews the status of commerce and manufacturing, government, religion, and civil society, the state's systems and institutions. Intimately familiar with Virginia's constitution, Jefferson outlined the state's proposed system of government, noting in detail the rights and laws that structure relationships, albeit unequally, between those aforementioned races. Um, and you could kind of see this, I mean, this was a diagram, you know, that it basically goes from a kind of natural history, you know, where he's talking about what's in the state. Uh, he, he starts to talk about the, the, the um, kind of um, information on like inhabitants. Uh, then he moves down to the question of laws. Um, this, is a, this is a very critical um, query 14, the administration of justice and descriptions of the laws. Also, um, six is also very, very important in terms of how he's describing what's actually in the state. So a kind of um, um, assessment, a taxonomy. And then it moves down, which I think is fascinating to the last, which is literally a history of the state. So it's going from natural history to man-made history, which I think is an important kind of um, trajectory or teleology about the development from nature to human civilization or what constitutes or who can constitute civilization. So in notes, um, Jefferson educates his reader on the very geography and diverse spaces, uh, species of, of the state. Now, he begins the first query by defining the territory out of which the state had been constituted. He literally says, this, this is the boundary here, this is the boundary here. In the 1788 edition, um, begins not with a written description of the state, um, but with Jefferson's own map. Uh, which is a redrawing of his father's map, published some 30 years later. By featuring the map, Jefferson emphasizes geography as the basis for human development. His use of cartography typified one means by with which Europeans had come to know the world, deployed as mechanisms to claim territory as part and parcel of European and now American imperial expansion. So cartography was a kind of key way of sort of knowing, of knowing the world, of rationalizing what's there. Um, Jefferson's sketch of New World ecology emphasizes the dynamic relationships between soil and climate, what he labeled as nutritive juices that sustain the life forces of the various species, including the human species that, that dwell on the land in Virginia. So in this period, naturalists like Jefferson observed that there were forces that affected how species of plants and animals developed over time. Um, he would write, quote, that the differences in increment um, depends on the circumstances unsearchable to beings in our capacity. And the difference in increments is, you know, the different ways in which minerals um, um, are, 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 are made, um, how plants grow, the scale and the different species of animals. Um, and, and so it's kind of unsearchable, he says, to beings with our capacity. Every race of animal seems to have been 
seems to have received from their maker certain laws of the extension at their time of their formation. So he's still suggesting maker, right, that God is, is what's allowing the differences of species of plants and animals. So in Jefferson's mind, divine forces still regulated the laws of nature. This logic extended to the perceived differences in the physical and mental characteristics of the human species as well. A framework of historical succession was emerging from secular rationalism, but these measurable innate forces were not yet determined to be ones that humans or other entities could direct, as 19th century sciences would reveal and then attempt to control. For Jefferson, one should ask how were his observations of racial differences of, human, of the human species relevant to the past and future of Virginia? So elsewhere, this is in query six, Jefferson ref refutes at length the hypothesis of French naturalist Comte de Buffon. In particular, the Frenchman's claim that, quote, animals common to both the new uh, and the old and new world are smaller in the latter. So basically, Buffon is throwing shade on America, saying that your plants and animals are much smaller than ours in Europe. Um, Jefferson did not like that. So, um, and, and, and Buffon is saying this is in part because there's more heat and humidity in the New World, and that's why everything is, is much smaller. So through an analysis of different species of animals and vegetable in relationship to Virginia's climate and geography, Jefferson countered that there was no reduction in the stature um, and diminished diversity of American species. Now, this is a crucial assertion for Jefferson to refute because Buffon's theory of degeneration was also, also applicable to the human species, in particular to American Indians, the aboriginal human species indigenous to the Americans, to, to the Americas. So it behooved Jefferson to counter Buffon on the point of physical and mental degeneration precisely because the species what he calls Homo sapien, sapiens europaeus, and he's using Linnaeus' term here, now lived in this exact same geography and climate. So they were living in this humid and hot right, territory. Right? Um, that, and, 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 and Europeans were also being nourished by the same plants and animals as the Indian of North America. So in nature, all races of the human species had been born equal, or at least this is what was being argued at this point, which was a view cherished by natural rights advocates, drawing upon Jean Locke, Montesquieu, um, but this was also adopted by those Americans who had envisioned this new nation. So it was, however, the difference in how far each race had advanced to become self-conscious, self-determined subjects capable of self-governance a, st a state of enlightenment depending upon um, the innate um, faculties of mind and body that mattered the most. So it's the scale of civilization and who was on this end versus who was on this end, I think, was critical. Thus, uh, Jefferson writes, before we condemn the Indians of the continent as wanting genius, we must consider that letters have not been introduced among them. Right? So they, they don't have you know, reading, they don't have writing, it's just not there. Their civilization hasn't advanced yet. So in other words, they hadn't evolved into a rationalized state of civilization. So advancing this logic of this observation in Query 6, Jefferson defends, quote, races of, Europe's, uh, races of whites transplanted from Europe. He shields them from Buffon's caustic judgments that, quote, belittle her productions on this side of the Atlantic. That's the throwing shade part. Jefferson provides evidence, and he says in philosophy, in war, in government, oratory, painting, the plastic arts, to show that, quote, America, though but a child of yesterday, has already given hopeful proofs of genius, quote. So America, its politics and culture, as Jefferson had already assessed in his letter to Madison, was still young. It was still in its infancy. But he was confident that it would rival, if not surpass, Europe in the, if the minds and the tastes of its citizenry could be properly nurtured by perfectly proportioned architecture, for example. So these notions would underpin the 19th century um, ideology, uh, ideology of progress in the disciplines like anthropology that designated the superior 
white races to lead the primitive darker races forward in the march of civilization. And you can already see the seeds of this in Jefferson's writings in the notes of State of Virginia. But the European slave trade had transplanted another race to the Americas, Homo sapiens Afer, Africans or Negroes. For Jefferson, their natural, naturally inferior faculties, as I will show, could not be incorporated into the new nation state. So I strategically use Negro or black rather than African American to encompass their um, ambiguous state at this historical moment. Since black were neither citizens, nor many of them Africans, with some having descended from African, Native American, and European families who had lived in Virginia for at least two centuries at this point. So in query 14, this is the one of administration of justice and the description of the laws, Jefferson sought a political solution to the problem of what to do with these Negroes living in the state of Virginia, the majority of whom were enslaved, but that included a small minority of freed men and women and children whose numbers were indeed growing. On several occasions through state legislation and also early drafts of the Declaration of Independence, Jefferson had proposed language that terminated the importation of slaves into both Virginia and the United States. And he would succeed, as many of you know, in 1808 in abolishing the international slave trade, but not its lucrative domestic market. Another strategy that Jefferson proposed as to what to do with our Negro population was to free enslaved Africans by incremental reduction in ownership. Both terminating the odious slave trade and emancipating enslaved blacks would gradually wean white dependence upon enslaved labor, which he hoped to replace with free white labor, yeoman farmers, the backbone of Jefferson agrarian democracy. But along with political concerns, Jefferson held, quote, physical and moral objections to the Negro based on his lifelong observations of their comportment and character. Jefferson was visually and viscerally appalled by the lack of overall beauty in blackness. So these are aesthetic questions. He rationalized what counts as beautiful could not be applied, could be applied to the breeding of animals. And therefore, why not to the human species, where variations are made visible in physiognomy, in hair texture, and skin color? So this is also presaging you know, the kind of logics of eugenics right, that emerges in the 19th century. Out of all of these, it was skin color that was the most obvious right, register of racial difference. The origins of skin colorations, however, could not be discerned by the dissection of the epidermal layers or through chemical analysis of blood or bile. Jefferson determined then that skin color was, quote, fixed in nature. And therefore, it was of divine causation. So God made us how we are, our skin, its own color. So to Jefferson's probing gaze, in comparison to the symmetry and flowing hair of the white physiognomy of the white body, the black body was categorically less beautiful. He verified this observation by suggesting that even Native Americans find whites preferable in much the same way, quote, and this is one of the most insidious um, uh, passages, I think, from Notes of Virginia, um, quote, the preference of the orangutan for the black woman over those of his own species, end quote. And this degrading theory was based on polygenesis that had circulated 10, early, uh, ten year earlier in um, Epic Long, who was also a plantation owner, his Epic History of Virginia. So the Negro's inability to, of, uh, to appreciate beauty, except in the most sensual, sensual manner, or to even create works of true aesthetic value, except out of mimicry, also provided Jefferson with additional evidence of their natural mental inferiority. So Jefferson would say, in memory, they are equal to, rights, uh, to whites um, in query 14, but their ability to reason, to comprehend mathematics, or to understand the sciences is certainly inferior. Quote, in their imagination, they are dull, tasteless, and anomalous. Quote. Now, to affirm the truth of his observations <coughs> on the Negro race, he offers poet Phyllis Wheatley and composer Ignatius Sancho as examples of inferior minds. So, you know, he's thinking as a natu naturalist. I, I have to prove my point. So this is, these are my examples. 
Phyllis Wheatley's owners named her Phyllis after the slave ship that had transplanted her from West Africa to Boston. Wheatley had learned to read and write at a young age. Influenced by Milton and Homer, she began to write poetry and a collection and published a collection of her poetry in 1773 and circulated widely. George Washington had a copy of the volume in his library. Wheatley had also advocated for the natural rights of slaves in America and was eventually freed upon the death of her owner in 1778. Jefferson, and this is what he writes in the notes of Virginia, however, believed that Wheatley was incapable of writing poetry since love for the Negro, in his mind, can only stimulate the senses but not the imagination, right, which requires a kind of higher level of, of perception and understanding. Her poems, he wrote, were, quote, below the dignity of criticism, quote. Now, Jefferson held equal disdain for Ignacio Sancho, whose, quote, letters do more to honor the heart than the head, quote. Sancho, like Wheatley, was born into slavery and brought to England, where he had served several wealthy families. He, too, was self-educated, advocated for the abolition of slavery in a series of letters that brought him great fame and great praise. Sancho became a well-known actor. He was also a playwright. He was a composer. And he became acquainted with many of Europe's political and aristocratic elites. But in notes, Jefferson would rank Ignacio Sancho at the bottom in comparison to contemporary white men of letters. He contemptuously suggested that if Sancho's works had any merit at all, it was most likely attributable to a white collaborator rather than Sancho's own genius. So where, then, was the place of the Negro in America? As mentioned earlier, Jefferson's emancipation scheme proposed that enslaved children, quote, this is in the notes of Slate of Virginia, this is exactly the same query, 14, um, should continue with their parents to a certain age, then be brought up at public expense to tillage arts or sciences according to their respective geniuses. When they had reached adulthood, women age 18, men 23, they, quote, should be colonized to a place as the circumstances of the time should render most proper. Um, this civilizing mission to Africa should support them, quote, till they, have, till they shall have acquired strength. Jefferson follows with a solution to replace the now absent black labor by sending, quote, vessels at the same time to other parts of the world for an equal number of white inhabitants. Quote. So this would seed Jefferson's vision of a nation of white freeholders who would expand the nation's boundaries westward. Now, Jefferson believed <clears throat> um, the history of, in the history of Virginia, that those, quote, deep-rooted prejudices entertained by whites and 10,000 recollections by blacks of the injuries they had sustained. And I think of Anna's sort of, you know, this kind of constant sort of ticking away. I mean, I think this is exactly what Jefferson's talking about. Would prevent black and white races from living peacefully together in the same place. Um, so emancipation and citizenship for freed blacks could only result in, quote, convulsions, which will never, which will probably never end, but in the extermination of one or the other race. So he imagined if blacks would have been freed and became, there would be, there would be a race war. So in Jefferson's estimation, American civilization could not thrive with a free black population. The undesirability of blackness, the quote, unfortunate difference of color and perhaps faculty is a powerful obstacle to the emancipation of their people, which I think is interesting because he talks about it both in terms of a difference of color and also faculty. So from aesthetic viewpoint, but, but also from, from a physiognomic, a kind of um, question of the mind, so it's mind and body, it's a powerful obstacle to their emancipation. If blacks were free, Jefferson feared also miscegenation, which required them to be, quote, removed beyond the reach of mixture, quote. Um, these sentiments would, would, were not new, but were beginning to circulate widely, including among some abolitionists, um, and that colonization societies on both sides of the Atlantic eventually led to the founding of Liberia and Sierra Leone on the coast of 
West Africa. So, so some of these ideas were in fact implemented. So while emancipation may have been desirable for political and moral reasons, the economic realities of how slavery built the wealth and maintained the well-being of white Americans made it difficult to terminate an already two-century-long reliance on slavery. The enlightened white men who liberated the nation espoused the humanistic value of natural rights, Lockean life and liberty, yet many were unwilling to depart with their human property. Some of Jefferson's generation did manument their slaves, either, upon, uh, either during their lifetime or upon death, as George Washington did and his heirs. Um, however, Jefferson owned up to 200 slaves at one time, more than 600 over his lifetime, but had freed only seven. Two during his lifetime, five men upon his death. So as Jefferson records in later editions of notes, that there were almost as many enslaved blacks as there were free whites living in Virginia. This is in 1792. So the number of free blacks had grown substantially as slaveholders freed their slaves after the Revolutionary War. But those manumissions began to taper off as the value of slaves increased with the domestic slave trade prospering in the new territories that the West, that opened up in the West. So on these large plantations, slave labor was indispensable for cultivating crops like wheat and cotton, which were becoming more popular because tobacco farming had exhausted the soil and the tidewater. Enslaved blacks could also be hired out to other plantations or perform unskilled and skilled jobs in cities, thus continuing to be profitable for their owners, which was true, actually, in the building of UVA. Um, Post-revolutionary war cities like Alexandria and Richmond, where the Virginia state capital was under construction, was teeming with enslaved um, men, women, and children. Uh, and so this is an example, you know, that to essentially say that, that Jefferson really wanted to, uh, you know, really kept, kept his property. I mean, he, he, he did not free, free um, many. <clears throat> so back to Paris in 1785. So Jefferson writes to his fellow directors in Richmond that it might be wise to get craftsmen well-versed in wood, stone, and plaster from Europe, given the scarcity of talented craftsmen in Virginia. He was complaining about this actually quite a bit in, in notes on the state of Virginia. There just weren't good people to make good buildings. So, for example, securing the services of a skillful stonecutter would be key, according to Jefferson, because, quote, under the services of a skillful stonecutter would be, um, under the direction, under his direction, this is the stonecutter, Negroes who never saw a tool will be able to prepare the work for him to finish, end quote. So it would be enslaved laborers who would clear the land. They would dig the foundations, haul, cut the wood, saw, saw the wood. Um, they would make the bricks. They would lay the bricks. They would move the waste from Shaco Hill. Enslaved blacks provided the, the labor necessary to erect Jefferson's splendid monuments to, to American democracies. And if you actually go through the, the log books, you start to see exactly who owned slaves. And you know, they, they, they occasionally will note when, when enslaved labor was actually um, being, being utilized. <clears throat> so to conclude, um, blackness for Jefferson and others proved to be an impenetrable threshold to reason. It was distasteful. Blackness was seen as a, quote, sublime eternal monotony, a, quote, immovable veil of black, which covers all of the emotions of the other race. So a completely inability to, to, to have a kind of imp, imp, empathic connection or an intellectual connection as well. And this is what Jefferson again writes in Query 14. Now, wielding the tools of enlightenment, Jefferson rationalized the Negro to the back end of the emerging teleology of American civilization. While all men were born equal, as natural rights proponents had advocated, to Jefferson, the Negro possessed neither the aptitude to reason nor the faculties to appreciate the beautiful or liberty. The constitution of a free black America, American was both unreasonable and unimaginable to the sage of Monticello. Coda. Beyond what Jefferson may have thought about the creativity of Phyllis Wheatley or Ignacio Sancho or others, they nevertheless had the audacity to write poetry in plays. 
When blacks like William Lee could, they would steal away from the oppressive violence of slavery to spaces, both real and virtual, where they nurtured bonds of community and a sense of the self. Proud, contemplative, curious, and determined, they actually were self-possessed in their vivid imaginations, as well as in their determination to be free, to seek a good life, aspirations that are quintessentially American. Thank you. This is an ongoing conversation. <laughs> but, um, so I'm wondering the extent to which you think that these, um, this sort of proto-racism uh, proto or racism explicitly that's uh, uh, integral in Jefferson's <coughs> language really does get physically built into the structure of early governance um, in Richmond, here in Charlottesville, in, this, in the landscape of the actual the village in, in Washington. Um, what's uh, can you begin to see the tie between uh, the kind of po uh, political and social positioning of race and the reality or the experience of race in real places? Yeah, I mean, I have to kind of, as part of this project, I mean, this, I'm still sort of conceptually trying to figure this out, like really kind of in, in engaged philosophy, you know, which kind of shapes the emergence of the modern discipline of architecture. I mean, it's, cl it's, it's clear, it's racialized. Um, but part of what I want to read are the plans, um, the locations of the buildings within cities, relationships between neighborhoods. So n the next chapter after this one is Washington, D.C., because basically I I'm going to argue that Richmond is the kind of beta for, for, for Washington. And, and, you know, it's clear they can't get, they literally cannot get labor. They, I think they try to get it from Scotland. No. I mean, there was just like, there are no people who want to come to the Americas. So then they literally have to then get plantation owners in the areas to bring in enslaved labor. Well, that labor to some degree settles and it stays, you know, it's, it's there in the city. And so my middle chapter, chapter three, I want to understand exactly how that landscape worked, right? So you have this emerging democracy and it has to work as a city. It's both private and public spaces. So I kind of want to do a geography of that to understand, okay, then, then what is its, its, its lived conditions? I mean, I, I wrote a piece for um, Eflux Architecture on a, for a project called Superhumanity um, that's associated with the recent Istanbul Biennial. And, you know, going through the archives, I came across this jail, this tiny six cell jail that Jefferson had designed for uh, Nelson, I think, in Cumberland County. And it, and it actually got built. But what interests me in that plan was the designation within the jails. And what I, what I write about in the article, because part of, part, of, part of what prompted was the fact that the AIA has refused to not build, to basically say the human rights issues of the construction of jails, right, it's, it's not our problem. Um, and so I try to argue, well, yeah, if you've got a 93% white profession, of course not. You won't see it as your problem. And I looked at the Jefferson to say, yeah, this is exactly how it gets instantiated. Because if you look at the six cells, the two front ones are for white debtors, so they have the most access to the public. The second ones are described as uh, male, female, white criminals. And then the back ones are just black male and female bodies, so not even recognized as the law. They're, like, they're not adjudicated by the law. They're outside the law. They're property. You know, and for me, that really set up an interesting hierarchy to say, yeah, that really does get inscribed spatially, I think, in, in the architecture that we, we live in, um, in a way. So. Um, I have a question. <clears throat> As a person who also went to UVA, um, and, and kind of thinking about your research um, from the perspective of an educator as well, and I know you teach at Columbia, um, but how, um, when we talked about, I, I came through in nine, 1998, and we talked like ad nauseum about the lawn and Jefferson's kind of legacy of physical spaces that are around and could be observed by students. And I'm wondering, we never, we kind of, you know, all my teachers uh, approached it from a very modernist, purely spatial analysis kind of lens. And that was kind of the driving force behind my education was like, let's think about it in spatial terms and not social terms. 
And I'm wondering if you could speak to what the implications are for your teaching, because I feel like now that these issues are getting brought up more in the dialogue, I'm kind of understanding, oh my gosh, like these spaces have these social dimensions that mm -hmm. you're speaking to. Um, so I'm wondering how, how you begin to introduce that to students so that they can begin to see like prisons as their problem or, um, because these Jefferson stances are still alive in, our, in the way we think about designing um, architecture. So I'm just curious how you approach that. Yeah, no, I think there's a lot to learn from Jefferson. And clearly the lawn, right, it's, 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 it's you know, I mean, it's space. I think all of the pavilions are supposed to be exercises, right, and certain kind of questions around aesthetics and proportion and form. And, you know, they're supposed to teach us literally what is good architecture, you know, and the students would have learned that and then go to their respective towns and then build something likewise. Um, um, in terms of my teaching, I teach a class called um, Thinking Race, Reading Architecture, where right now I'm teaching it as a doctoral dissertation, but I've taught it as a graduate level seminar, and I've had undergraduates in it, um, that basically sort of says if you read, read the Enlightenment text, so we read Kant and Herder and Hegel, and uh, we actually went further this, this time, and we were reading um, sort of analyses of um, earlier colonial texts, right, which would not have been pre, sort of pre-enlightenment texts. I really understand, like, where does the curse of him come from? And, you know, what, does, what are the problems when you have the new world? And, and how do you have a certain cosmology in, in the Christian world versus other kinds of worldview frameworks? And then how do they mix, right? Um, and so one of the things to do is kind of read that and understand how that thinking is evolving Right? And then how does architectural discourse, particularly the modern discourse of architecture, emerge out of that? So um, I'm working on a volume which will hopefully be useful in the classroom with colleagues um, Irene Cheng at CCA and Charles Davis at UNC Charlotte called Race and Modern Architecture. And so we start in the Enlightenment um, and we, we, we look at, we're looking at Jefferson, but you know, there are people, that works on Van Brunt, Henry Van Brunt, Villadou, um, thinking of some of the architects in, um, that are being examined. But, but essentially saying, like if you read Ornament and Crime and you think about it in its racial language, it's incredibly racialized. It's a civilizationist narrative, right? And yet we only ever talk about it. It's like they want to get ornament off. No, actually they're talking about the emergence of European civilization and industrialization in, in very particular ways when the colonial project, right, pre-World War I was huge and the resource extraction um, from um, colonial holdings was was astounding. And yet it only gets read in a certain way in architecture. That completely skips over this. So it's to kind of take all of this stuff and read the seminal documents and, and um, architects, I think, in a different way. Because I think it's already, it's embedded in the tools, it's embedded in the body of knowledge that we learn as architects. And, you know, like when I was sitting in this room, it was like looking in a mirror and not seeing yourself, right? So you're alienated from, from that discourse. And, and my fundamental question is, how is architecture a tool for the instantiation of white supremacy? I mean, that's basically kind of what, like why, is, is it because it creates these boundaries and it maintains white bodies in ways it doesn't with other bodies? Uh, you could see this again and again and again historically. Um, so, and it, to, you know, to build, you gotta have money, you gotta have land, you've, you know, it's, it's interesting. And I think that also has to be unpacked as we turn toward architects for solutions to a lot of these, these issues as well. So you, 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 you know, it's the question, can you use the master's tool to dismantle the master's house? So we gotta question those tools. <laughs> Hi, so um, it seems that Jefferson you know, clearly embraces um, the forms of antiquity of the Romans and the Greeks, um, and they align well with his ideas of white supremacy. But um, what, if any, examples are there of anxiety that he might have had or some of his contemporaries about using Egyptian forms and how they might have challenged some of these ideas about building this racial line at the time? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's always, um, it's very interesting when you always put Egypt into the mix. Like, I still think at this period it's, you know, there, it's all, particularly because it's the Mediterranean. And again, that's what I mean, it's that racial difference isn't yet determined in the same way in the hierarchies that we believe. It's emerging, that's why I think Jefferson's interested. He's just trying to figure this out. Um, I think it's, there's a really great book called, by Martin Bernal called Black Athena, where he says that a kind of Aryan model replaced the Semitic model of history. So previous ones really saw Phoenicians, Nubians, Egyptians, the exchange between Greece, 
you know, in that whole region, right, of Middle East, like it, it's all mixed up, right, historically. But then there's a, an attempt, and you can read this actually in Ville Doux. Uh, is it Ville Doux or Simper that writes that history of Aryan, you know, the history of, ah, uh, there's something like a history of Aryan architecture. It's Simper. Yeah, 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 that writes that, right, where they're trying to chase, it's the same is true for, philo I mean, they're trying to chase the origins of languages and, um, um, uh, two certain kinds of origins in Asia, right? So Asia is seen as the origins of civilization. But that has to do with a kind of rise of modern sciences in a way. And that, I think, kind of shifts, shifts the model. There's an emergence, I think, of questions of style uh, in the 1820s and 30s. So I'm, one of my chapters is actually on the Smithsonian, where there was a debate about what is American. And they don't, you know, they just basically kind of on pragmatic, rational, utilitarian say, well, why are we trying to build you know, kind of Greek and Roman temples when we don't have marble, and we use sandstone, which is softer, so we should probably turn toward the Gothic, which is more authentically Northern European. You know, so there's a kind of already a kind of tinge of an emergence um, within that. And this isn't to treat Europe as a monolith either, because there were racial differences being sorted out as well within Europe, and God bless the Irish. I mean, <laughs> I mean, you know, the English cast them so far below Right, they're Catholic, you know, they're feudal, they're, you know, and it, the logic was kind of, well, let's just send them to America, right? Um, and so, you know, questions of racial difference are playing themselves out. It's a kind of framework to, to, to produce, I think, I, Foucault says it very well in the modern sense of the modern state, to make life and to let die, you know, and that's the hierarchy. And so the, the argument Black Lives Matter is it precisely to refute the let die, I think. Uh, thanks for a great talk. Um, I wanted to go back to the painting of Sam Jennings, which I thought was really provocative. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a landscape architecture student, and a lot of our recent conversations, we've been talking about how nature is often encoded in terms of gender in a lot of writings, and specifically... Yeah, like Natalie, not Natalie Merchant, Carolyn Merchant's. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, and specifically female a lot of times, and mm -hmm. talking about, you know, like productive or supple or pure, these kinds of things, and has a lot to do with how we treat nature. Um, so I'm interested in how maybe the language of nature is also racialized in a lot of ways in terms of wild or savage or these kinds of things. And I think that uh, that dialogue should also be an important. And so I think this was like a really interesting basis um, for thinking about that. I'm wondering in your readings of Jefferson if you saw these kind of racialized encodings of nature. Um, and I'm interested in this paradox, I guess, specifically because um, nature is often seen as beautiful, which was not something that like the Negroes had access to in the eyes of Jefferson. So I'm curious if you saw any of that, because nature is kind of seen as this antithesis of civilization, civilization, architecture, that kind of stuff. Yeah, no, I, it's a really good question. I'm thinking, I was just having this conversation actually with Charles Davis and my students around nature, because he was talking about Louis Sullivan and the influence of Emerson on Sullivan. Um, and, and, you know, I said, it's, it's very interesting because you get both nature you know, as a thing of reflection, or even the space of reflection, but simultaneously, n you know, nature is also being, it's a resource, right? I mean, you're literally extracting coal, gold, like everything, you know, and so there's this kind of duality between it, um, which I think is, is, you know, kind of part and parcel of the emergence of the thinking subject, the, you know, the ability to kind of reflect and produce representations of that landscape at the same time that materially you're also transforming it. Um, uh, as well. Um, and so I think to cast certain bodies in the landscape, right, as labor, and this would be true for f farmers, I mean, um, you know, people who labor in the, in the landscape become a part of, a part of that landscape, uh, versus kind of the aesthetic questions of landscape, which kind of can tend to, to paper over, you know, the kind of workings and the ugliness, in a way, of that. And so I do think, you know, kind of romantic, kind of romantic philosophy sort of produces, I think, that, but that's a whole other, <laughs> that I actually have to dig much deeper in, you know, to kind of think about Kant and, you know, um, Burke and, you know, the kind of debates of the romantics um, in that. But you, you see that in the ways in which, you know, the westward move is happening. So f for me, it's the chapter on the Smith Smithsonian that I will think about that, which has to do with also how Native Americans are also presented and positioned in that landscape and are racialized and become, you know, they go from becoming a noble savitive to the kind of primitive, this is, this is the past of America, 
Um, and the Smithsonian essentially collects the artifacts to produce that primitiveness, right? Um, and then there's the project to assimilate Native Americans, assimilate the Negro into the American project, uh, which then later happens also for immigrants as well. So. We're at time, so I'm going to, I'm just uh, asking you to join me, take me into the table. Thank you.